Welcome back, everyone. In this episode, we're going to be reviewing and doing analysis on three high-quality dividend-paying companies that I consider to be very good compounders that are not they're not currently in my portfolio. They're just on the watch list. The first one is the Flavor King McCormick. I'm gonna be going over this company because most of you are familiar with the brand, but you probably don't know the full extent of what this company actually does. When you dive into it, it's a little bit surprising. The next one's Hershey's. Everyone knows Hershey's, the salty and sweet snack king. This company is an enormous long-term compounder, and I think it has incredible growth ahead of it. So we'll be looking at Hershey's as well. And then last but not least, we'll be looking at one of the biggest, fastest growing beauty companies, Estee Lauder. So we'll be diving into all three of these. I'll be giving you my thoughts on them and what would need to happen for them to go into my portfolio. Now, before we jump into the individual security analysis, I just want to mention one thing. We've been told a month ago by a lot of people to be concerned, to be bearish, to be macro investors, focus on the macro events and the inflation and the unemployment and the recession that we're surely going into. We're going into a bad recession. We're laying off lots of people. Inflation's out of control. And the stock market was headed downward. In fact, when it got to this point, that's when people were peak bearish. We had lots of videos made on YouTube with flames in the background, people trying to scare you out of sticking with your stocks. Over the past 30 days, things have turned around a lot. In fact, if I filter my returns by the past one month, I'm up around 12.15%, which is $40,000 in just a 30-day period. We look at the news and the tone has changed a little bit. This is the fourth straight winning streak in the market. Four weeks in a row of the market going up and up and up. What happened to people's predictions of doom and gloom? What happened to the people that sold out a month ago? Now they're sitting there 10% lower than the market, hoping, praying that the market will come back down so that they can buy back in at the price they were at just a month ago. This is what the S&P 500 looks like over the past 30 days. Big tech rallied huge. Basically every single index, except maybe healthcare, had a very good month. In fact, healthcare and telecom seems to be the only real outlier out of this rally. And then we can even look at the earnings season. I kept track on this list, my companies, and whether or not they beat their earnings or beat their revenue, and whether or not they gave strong forecast or weak forecast. The huge majority of my companies not only beat their revenue, but they beat their earnings per share, and they gave strong guidance. Disney was the last one to do this. They crushed their earnings, they crushed their revenue, and they gave continual strong guidance. Overall, around 76% of my portfolio beat their earnings, which is much better than the average and the historical average of the S&P 500. So this whole earnings season that people are talking about as being a doomsday earnings season, that companies were going to have shrinking revenues and terrible guidance, that didn't really pan out. And the investors that bet on all of this going down are now in a very difficult situation. Inflation expectation is another thing where you had a lot of doom and gloom. Lots of people continue to pound the drum of fear, saying that you should get out of the market, that you should be concerned about inflation, eating away at any returns in companies. And then we had the inflation report come in and it went from 9.1% to 8.5% year over year. Inflation actually eased from its four decade high. Now, of course, we're not out of the weeds yet with inflation, but now at least is moving in the right direction. And there's a strong possibility that we have reached what some people consider to be peak inflation. And even on this Friday, to close out the rest of the week, we have the market moving up yet again. Terry Smith, someone I've been studying recently, said, when it comes to so-called market timing, there are only two sorts of people those who can't do it, and those who know they can't do it. So you can decide what type of person you are. You're one or the other. Now, before jumping into those individual analysis, I want to go ahead and give a portfolio update to start. This is the passive income portfolio. If you're new to the show, I share this transparently every single week, week by week, whether it's good or bad. And I show continued performance, what I'm buying, what I'm selling, and the reasons why. So far, the portfolio value is 375,000, 56,000 of that being gains, 40,000 market gains and 15,000 earned dividends. And basically what I look for are high quality dividend paying companies that I think will compound their earnings for a long period of time. So I'm not looking for companies that I have to buy in and sell out of repeatedly. I'm not looking at the best value stock of any given time. I'm looking for companies that will grow their earnings for year after year after year. Another name for these type of companies are compounders. And compounders have certain characteristics, 
Typically, they have good franchise durability, meaning that they have brand recognition. This is something that Terry Smith and Bill Ackman look for with each of their holdings. They want companies that have very good brand recognition. They also have to have free cash flows. Beyond what they pay in stock-based compensation, these companies need to generate real cash. And the free cash flow yield is also a way of valuing the companies. We typically want to find these companies at a free cash flow yield of 4-6%. to If not, we can get into the 3 range. That's sometimes acceptable, but we're not looking for companies with a free cash flow yield of 1-2%. or We want to get a higher free cash flow yield than that. The third thing are companies... They can grow without using financial leverage. It's fine if they have leverage, but we want companies that have minimal debt. They can continue to grow even if they had no access to the debt markets. And then we have another one that's a preference of mine, which is non-cyclical, meaning companies outside of banks and oil companies that go through these big boom and bust cycles. It's okay to have some of those companies, but I'd rather have the majority of my portfolio have very strong earnings through any market cycle. Number five, I want companies that have recurring revenue. This doesn't necessarily mean subscription revenue, but this just means products that are not durable, long-term products that you buy once and keep for year after year after year. I want companies that sell products that you buy them, you consume them, and then you need to buy more and more of them. Those are recurring revenue. So you think of Monster Energy Drink as a recurring revenue. That company sells their Monster Energy Drinks and people have a couple drinks a day and they have to buy more of them. They can't extend the duration of a Monster Energy Drink. You compare that to something like a car. Somebody can buy a car and they keep that car for literally a decade. And if they want, they can even extend the lifetime of that vehicle during a recession. So when I look at recurring revenue, the framework that I look at that through are things that are consumable, things that are used, and the lifetime of it can't really be extended. And then after that, we typically want a company that returns capital. Dividends make up a huge portion of the total returns of the stock market, and companies that pay dividends over a long-term history have outperformed those that don't. And I want companies that typically pay a growing dividend or they do buybacks. In most cases, I want them to do both. So this is a brief overview of what I'm looking for. It's a guideline of the type of stocks that I do research on. And I try to filter down from thousands of stocks into just a couple dozen of them that meet all of these qualifications. So with that general idea of what type of company I'm looking for, what I define as a compounder, I'm trying to create a list of companies that I could potentially invest in and I did this by filtering through hundreds of companies and looking for ones that meet most of these qualifications. The best ones out of the ones that I looked for. And I created this list. This is a watch list on Qualtrum Insights called Compounders. So we have some of the companies that are already in my portfolio. Costco, Microsoft, Apple, and Pepsi. But then we have a couple other ones that aren't in my portfolio. So today we're going to be looking at McCormick, Estee Lauder, and Hershey. Now let's start off with McCormick. I've pulled this company up on Qualtrum Insights, this website that you're looking at here with all the graphs. This is available as part of the Patreon membership. Now, if I type in the ticker symbol and I bring up the information, we can go through and see a lot of the fundamental data on the company. But before I like to do that and jump into all the numbers, I try to give context on what this company actually does. McCormick is a flavor company that has that nice brand franchise. They have a lot of brands under their belt that do hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars in revenue. And here are some of the recognizable brands that they own. We have Brand Aromatic, Billy B. We have Cattleman's Barbecue Sauce, Cholula Hot Sauce, Clubhouse. These are ones where you go into the grocery store, your local grocery store, and you're almost guaranteed to have an entire aisle full of spices that has a lot of the stuff that you recognize. Different things for barbecues, for Asian food, for Mexican food. We have lots of different variety amongst their flavors. So those are their most notable brands, but a lot of people don't realize that they do something outside of this. McCormick is more than just a consumer spice company. In fact, there are a lot more. If we look at their revenue breakdown, 62% of their revenue comes from the consumer. That's the type of stuff we just looked at, those type of brands. But then 38% come from flavor solutions. And that's a big chunk of the company. Almost 40% is coming from Flavor Solutions. Well, what is that? It's not their consumer brand. What is Flavor Solutions? McCormick says they're developing the future of flavor using our proprietary co-creation process. Our team develops flavors that are unique to customer products and brands, working with them through every stage of their product life cycle, from conception to formalization to commercialization. So they actually work with other companies to generate and create flavors and textures for their products. So 
Even if you don't buy McCormick branded consumer goods in your spice aisles, you may be actually still tasting McCormick flavors through other brands where you don't even realize it because McCormick has contracted with those companies to help them flavor their products. They create flavors for cereal, crackers and snacks, snack bars, sweet bakeries, lots of different meals, beverages and dairy and confectionery. So there you have it. This company is actually more diversified than meets the eye. They don't only have those spices and mixes that you have in the grocery store, but even if you're buying other products that aren't strictly branded McCormick, you're probably tasting a lot of the flavors that they've helped develop, and that's a big part of their business. In fact, out of the total growth of this company, the average three years growth of the consumer brand has been 4%, and their flavor solutions has been 8%. So a combined 6% total growth for the company over the past three years, and the majority of that is their flavor solution. This portion of the company is growing faster than their consumer goods portion. Now, having looked at that background, let's go ahead and dive into some of the fundamentals here. The company is at a $24 billion market cap. So it's a very large company, but it's not massive. This isn't a 200 billion plus company. It's right around that 20 billion market cap range where I still think there's a lot of room for growth there. Uh, but the P ratio is elevated. Like many of these higher quality companies that are very defensive, the PE ratio is in the mid 20s at a 27.4 PE. We have the free cash flow yield a little bit lower than what we like to see. We want a 4 to 6% preferably. This one's at a 2%. We could look for a company that has a 3% free cash flow yield, but unless they're growing their free cash flow at a very quick rate, we don't want to buy one at a 2 or 1%. Those are too low of free cash flow yields. You have to have a company that's either going to dramatically grow their free cash flow, or this is simply just too expensive. Now we can look at the revenue of this company. The revenue has a long-term growth story. A lot of the newer flashy tech companies, they can grow their revenues quickly for a couple years, but growing revenues at a steady pace since 1985 is not something that you see a lot of companies do. You have to have these characteristics to be able to accomplish this. They went from growing revenues from 870 million to now $6.32 billion in 2021. That is substantial long-term revenue growth. They had to slow down their last quarter because of different swings in supply and demand economics, but I do not think that will be a long-term thing. I think the long-term is gonna look a lot like the historical long-term. This company will continue to grow its revenues. The EBITDA matches very similarly, grows over the long-term, and then we have the free cash flow. It's a little bit more shaky, but the trend is still there. Since around 2010, we've had long-term free cash flow growth. It looks like it got hurt in 2021, probably because of margins, I'm guessing exposure in China, as well as issues in supply chain and shipping costs. That's affected a lot of these companies. Now we can look at the earnings of the company, the net income. Last year, they did $755 million in net income. And one thing that I'll do is compare this net income to their free cash flow. So they did 755 million in net income last year and their free cash flow was 550 million. So their cash conversion was something like 70%. That's not a great cash conversion for a company like this. So let's compare a year before the pandemic. In 2019, they did $702 million in net income. And in 2019, their free cash flow was $773 million. So they actually had above 100% cash conversion. I'm guessing that the majority of the time this company keeps around or above 100% cash conversion, but just the past year with China, with supply chains, with margin difficulty, this has come under pressure. So overall, I still think this company converts most of its net income into free cash flows. The other thing that we can look at is the earnings per share here. This is growing like crazy on a very consistent basis. Even during the difficult time from 2020 to 2021, they were able to grow their earnings per share. They seem to grow their earnings almost no matter what happens. They're more resilient than most companies in the market. Now let's go ahead and look at the cash and debt of this company. They currently have $3,900,000,000 in debt. It's a lot of debt, almost $4 billion in debt and $300 million in cash. I like to keep the actual debt to below three times their last year's EBITDA. So if we multiply the EBITDA by three times, we get 3.6 and that is within that category. All that means is that if this company wanted to, if McCormick decided, they could likely pay off all of this debt within three years. So they're using this debt as a tool, but it's not totally necessary to be able to run their business. Now let's go ahead and look at the dividend history of this company. Let's take a look here. We can go all the way back to around 2003. They're paying six pennies per quarter per share. 
and they've raised that all the way up to 37 cents. But they do have a current starting yield of 1.65%. Another thing that we can look at is the shares outstanding over time. This is something that I also think is okay for this company, but not the best. We have the shares outstanding going up slightly over the past five years. Since 2017, they went from 262 million up to 268 million. So they're not paying the fastest growing dividend and they're not really doing share buybacks at least over the past five years. So overall, McCormick is a high quality company. It has the diversified brands. I'm gonna keep it on the watch list, but I'm not gonna be investing in this company right now for a couple of reasons. The valuation is the first one. The free cash flow yield of 2% is just not high enough to get me excited about this company, especially considering that they're having current struggles growing their free cash flow back up to their net income. The company does have some exposure to China, which is weighing on their business, and I think that creates more unpredictability. Companies that I already own, like Church and Dwight, have no exposure to China. And then the other thing that I'd say is they're not returning a lot of money through dividends or share buybacks, and that to me is something that I look for in my companies. So right now, between the valuation and these other concerns, I'm gonna keep this company on the watch list. If it enters into a still, if it has some time period where it really trades down, I might pick up some shares, but as of right now, it's a pass. Now, the next one that I wanna look at is Hershey's, which the more I looked at this company, the more I was impressed with it. This one is an absolute monster. Before you think of Hershey's as just the company that sells Hershey's bars, you gotta erase that image from this company. They do so much more than selling Hershey's bars. For example, here's a list of some of their brands. We have on the left side, more of the sweet candies, and then on the right side, more of the salty, savory ones. Brookside, Jolly Ranchers, Twizzlers, Ice Cube, Kisses. Of course, they have the Hershey's bars there, but they also own Rolo, Reese's, Kit Kat, Mr. Good Bar. We have all these different brands they've accumulated outside of their namesake Hershey's brand. Then we have all these salty brands here, which was a surprise to me when I looked at this company, that they actually own Skinny Pop. I see these things in Costco's all the time. They're constantly selling, constantly turning over products. Skinny Pop seems to be a very fast growing brand and Hershey's has been moving more into these less bad for you treats. I won't say that they're healthy, but they're just not quite as bad for you or quite as heavy as some other snacks. The Skinny Pops and these type of different popcorns are a little bit lighter. They're less bad for you than the other candies. They also own the Dots brand, which is the fastest growing pretzel brand in the world. They own Pirate's Booty. This is another brand that I see in Costco all the time. It seems to have very quick turnover. They say it's gluten-free and never fried. They bought new chip brands that they're trying to compete with Pepsi with. They're getting into the protein market, making dessert protein bars, if you want to mix those two together. And they own Lily's, which is a sweet candy bar with no processed sugars and a lot more. This company overall has been on the move in terms of accumulating good brands and using their distribution system to get them into tons of stores growing their sales. So in all, I would just look at Hershey's as a lot more selling the Hershey's candy bar. That's the name of the company, that's their signature brand, but they own a lot more beyond that. Now, looking at the valuation of this company, this is such a, a beast. This company is an absolute monster. The PE ratio is at 28 Ford PE right now. Investors do not want to sell their shares in Hershey. In fact, when I look at the price change year to date, it's up 17% year to date. This is one of the best performing companies in the market currently. Over the past five years, it's up 113% and it doesn't seem to go down even during the big panics and sell-offs. There's some volatility in the price, but overall, this is a company that will continue to perform well. Now, even though on a PE ratio basis, this company seems more expensive than McCormick, on a free cash flow yield basis, which is what you're buying if you actually buy a company. You don't buy a company to buy its earnings. You buy the company to buy the free cash flow. The free cash flow yield of this company is 3.61%, much better than McCormick in terms of free cash flow. And they posted revenue of $8.97 billion in 2021. 2021 has been a good year for snacking. Last quarter's revenue growth was 19%. If I'm not mistaken, I think that beats out all of big tech. This company continues to grow its revenue right now faster than most big tech companies. Of course, the EBITDA matches the revenue growth, just growing over time. The free cash flow is probably the most impressive part of this company. If we swap over to free cash flow per share here, in the 2000s, it was $2, $1.80 per share. Now it's $8 per share. So they're growing their free cash flow per share on a very consistent basis, and they offer a current higher starting free cash flow yield. We can look at the cash conversion here, which is where we compare the net income of the company to the amount of free cash flow. 
We have $1.47 billion in net income in 2021, and we have $1.587 billion in free cash flow in 2021, which means this company has been able to maintain above a 100% cash conversion from their earnings into their cash flows, which is a very observable way to say that this company doesn't do any type of accounting gimmicks. They're not earning net incomes that don't translate into free cash flows. Their net income actually generates money for the investor. Now the earnings per share growth is where I think this company has a little bit more weakness than other consumer staple companies. There's been multiple time periods where the EPS really goes down a lot. From 2006 to 2007, it went down into a third of what it was, so a 70% drop. Then in 2014, it also dropped and took a couple years to recover. The earnings per share growth over a long enough time period has been good, but it's certainly not as consistent as some companies like Texas Roadhouse, like Costco, or even as consistent as McCormick. This is a weaker spot for this company. Now we can look at the balance sheet of the company and see if they have a chance of going bankrupt on us. We don't wanna buy companies that will have any type of financial strain. Their last quarter, they had $3 billion, $600 million in debt, and they had a couple hundred million dollars in cash. Last year, they posted $2.2 billion of EBITDA, so it's well within that three-year period. And again, that's just a rule of thumb to make sure they can pay for their debt. Now, moving on, we can look at the dividend. They've been raising their dividend for a long period of time. They only took a break in 2008. So they said during the recession, let's just halt the dividend. We'll continue to pay it, but we'll just halt it and not raise it for a couple of years. I think that was a fine decision and you can see their dedication to raising the dividend over time. The starting yield is also $1.82, but that's based off the last four quarters. So it's actually more like 2% if you base it just off of last quarter. That's a pretty good starting yield for a company that has a 3.5% free cash flow yield. Another thing I like to see is the company's not diluting you. They're doing share buybacks. Even as they accumulate big new brands and they're spending a lot of money, they've managed to do that without diluting the shareholder, which I think is very meaningful. So this is another check mark for this company. So overall, I really like what I see here with this stock. They have good brand franchise durability with a diversified group of brands from salty treats, sweet treats, unhealthy treats, and less unhealthy treats. They have a lot of different selection. I think they'll continue to own that snack and candy aisle for decades into the future. I cannot see a company like this being disrupted. And the company has a decent free cash flow yield, even considering their performance this year. They have a good starting dividend. They have a lot of safety and resilience in their business model. So overall, Hershey's is a company I like. I could see this one being part of my portfolio in the future. Right now, I'm gonna keep it on the watch list. I'll see if it goes through any big dips. I'm currently buying some other companies, but this is one that I really like, and I think it would make a good long-term compounder to own. Now, I hope you're enjoying this analysis. Before we move on to Estee Lauder, I have to give a quick shout out to today's sponsor of this video, which is FTX US. They're known as a cryptocurrency exchange, but they just opened up a stock trading brokerage. So you can actually sign up now, and this is out of beta. You can use their stock trading app. They have fractional shares. You can buy and sell anytime the market's open. They don't do what's called payment for order flow. And they're part of FINRA and SIPC insured. And if you sign up using one of the links in the pinned comment and you type in the refer code Carlson, my last name, you'll get $10 credited to you upon your first $100 trade. So sign up now and let me know what you think. Now, last one, we have Estee Lauder, the beauty company. One thing that's never going to go out of style, one thing that will likely never change is people wanting to look good. That's something that's gonna be around long-term and the companies that have been able to capitalize on this have made long-term compounded gains. L'Oreal being one of them and Estee Lauder being the other one. Estee Lauder has grown much faster over the past 10 years than L'Oreal and that's the reason that we're looking at it. Now this company owns a lot of diversified beauty brands. Some of them are skincare brands, so they're not necessarily makeup. We have a couple fragrance brands here. We have some hairdressing brands. We have some makeup brands. We have some more dermatologist brands. They're diversified across different parts of the beauty category. And a lot of these brands are the ones that you find in Ulta beauty stores. The thing that this company really controls are the names of these brands and their distribution. And that gives them a lot of pricing power and just a lot of power in general that's very difficult to replicate. There are competitors in this industry. There's constantly new startups and new companies trying to make new beauty brands to compete with Estee Lauder and L'Oreal. But typically if those brands ever get big enough, the play for them is to be bought out by Estee Lauder or L'Oreal. You can look at Tom Ford as an example. Estee Lauder is in talks to buy this luxury brand. So 
This is what these companies do. They have a massive portfolio that gives them a huge amount of free cash flow, and they're always looking to do acquisitions of any brand that gives promise that will add further to their massive portfolio, and it will get rid of one potential competitor. That's basically how they operate. Overall, it's proven to be a very good, sustainable business model. So Estee Lauder is considered to be a fast-growing, high-quality company. In that fast growth, it's priced at a high premium, a 33 Ford PE ratio, a free cash flow yield of 1.97. It's had incredibly good revenue growth over the past 10 years, going from 1.8 billion per quarter to 4.25 billion. So they continue to trudge along every single quarter, quarter by quarter. You minus out the one exception here, which is COVID, and this company continues to make growing revenues for decade after decade. The EBITDA shows relatively the same thing. It matches the revenue of the company. And then the free cash flow of this company is really what's important here. We can look from 2009, the free cash flow was 416 million. Last year, it was 2 billion. 900 million. So they grew the actual free cash flow, the money investors get to keep by six times over the past 11 years. Now, if we look at the cash conversion of the company, in 2021, they earned $2.8 billion in net income. And in 2021, they earned $2.9 billion in free cash flow. What does that mean? That means that the net income this company earns is not because of accounting gimmicks, they're actually translating it into profits for shareholders. And then we can look at the balance sheet. This is another strong point of this company above other defensive consumer staple companies. The debt right now is at $7 billion, but they currently have $3.8 billion in cash. And that gives them a net debt of $3.3 billion. Now, we compare that $3.3 billion of net debt to their last year's EBITDA, that's 4.1 billion. This company does not rely on the banks or leverage to grow. It's growing as an unlevered company. It does pay a growing dividend, so they do have some dedication to that, but it's not the most appealing dividend. This is where a lot of hardcore dividend investors will not want to invest in this company because they're growing it just a little bit every single quarter, and it has a starting yield of 0.88%. It has other qualities that I think make up for it, but in terms of just the dividend, that's not a strong point. The shares outstanding, generally speaking, have been going down over time. It's gone up a little bit in 2021, but now over the past year, they've been on a steady decline in shares outstanding, which means that they're growing their dividend and they're doing share buybacks. Overall, I really like this company. Estee Lauder has insanely good free cash flow growth. They can use that free cash flow to pick up new brands of potential competitors in the industry. They can use it to pay down their debt. They can use it to buy back shares or to grow their dividend. They have this luxury of having unlevered free cash flow growth. And even though the company is trading at a premium PE ratio, free cash flow will probably grow much faster than most companies in the market. And I see this company as one that's very unlikely to be disrupted over the next 20 years. So in my opinion, this is a great one. I'm not buying it right now, but this one's going to remain high on the watch list. I'll be looking for opportunities to reintroduce this company back into my portfolio. So that's a look at those three companies. Out of the three, my personal favorite was Hershey's. I think that company is the best overall. I think after that, we have Estee Lauder in a close second. And then in third place, I'd put McCormick. That'd be how I rank it. Let me know if you agree or disagree with that. And let me know if there's any high quality compounding company that I'm missing. I'm constantly trying to expand this watch list of high quality companies that I keep track of. So if the opportunity presents itself and they trade far down below their 200 day moving average, like Church and Dwight right now, which is one that I am currently buying, I can start picking up shares of these companies. So I hope you enjoyed this episode. I'll continue to look at more companies and do more research. So that's all for now. I hope you enjoyed and I'll see you in the next one.